Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and greetings to you from nearly 100,000 of your sisters and brothers in Christ who with you make up the Nebraska Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Growing disciples, walking together, serving God's world. It's who we are and it's what we do. Impacting that world as near as next door and as far as the other side of the globe. You've heard me say it before, but hear me say it again. There are people all over the globe who will go to bed tonight giving thanks to God for you, because you, through your care, your generosity, your prayers, your actions, have touched and transformed and even saved their lives or the lives of people they love. On behalf of all those people whom you will never meet, and on behalf of all of us who get to be your partners in those remarkable world-changing ministries, please hear me say thank you. Thank you and God bless you for being the remarkable people of the Nebraska Synod. Well, it is Pentecost Sunday, or as we say in the Nebraska Synod, Big Red Sunday. Or if you're not hearing this message on Pentecost Sunday, then remember at least that in the same way that every Sunday is a celebration of Easter, of Christ's resurrection, then, then every single day is a celebration of Pentecost in the life of the believer. A celebration of the Spirit of Christ coming into our lives and moving us out into the world to serve Christ and his people. If you're seeing this or hearing this on Pentecost Sunday, it is the 50th Sunday, the 50th day of the Easter season. If you're hearing this on Pentecost Sunday, you'll also note that it is the 85th day since we have been removed from physically gathering together in our sanctuaries. In either case, what we mark today is an incredible disruption. In the Bible stories we hear today, it is the incredible disruption of the power of the Holy Spirit. In our own lives, it is the awful disruption of the threat of the coronavirus. It struck me in preparing to preach this year that this is a year in which we have two Pentecost stories in the day's scriptures, one from the Acts of the Apostles, the other from the Gospel of John. But both of those Pentecost stories are set among a people who are physically distancing, who are sheltering in place. In the book of Acts, it's the followers of Jesus long after his resurrection who have not gone home to their homes in the countryside, have not gone back to their jobs, but are instead sheltering in place in Jerusalem, waiting to receive the gift of power from on high that Jesus bothered, promised them. They are gathered together in an upper room, waiting. In John's Gospel, the Pentecost story comes in John's own unique way when, when Jesus breathes his breath, the gift of the Holy Spirit, on his disciples. But it happens the very night of Easter when this Jesus' disciples are sheltering in place behind locked doors because they're afraid the authorities are going to come and do to them what they did to Jesus. In both stories, God's people are sheltering in place, quarantined, maintaining physical distance. In the Acts of the Apostles, in that upper room, it's a sheltering of anticipation, hoping for a gift they don't completely understand, but anticipating its coming. In John's Gospel, it's a sheltering in place of fear a fear of what exactly they don't know. They don't know how they'll be treated or even if someone's coming for them. In both places, it's more or less a sheltering place of marking time, of just waiting, of sitting in neutral while the engine revs, sort of like Holy Saturday was on Easter weekend. And we know what that feeling is like. While we wait, too, for things to return back to whatever normal is going to be, we don't know exactly what it is we're waiting for, what it's going to look like when that happens. Whether fear or anticipation, a little of both or neither, we're just waiting and we're marking time. But 
But we're reminded again that scripture is not just some ancient history book about some foreign people. It is our book, our family album, the story of us, God's people even today. And so Pentecost comes to us in our sheltering in place, just as it did so long ago to those who experienced the first blowing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' followers, 120 of them, were all gathered together when they heard the rush of a mighty wind and they were, they were blown out into the streets, away from that room where they had found shelter, where they were comfortable and gathered together, enjoying one another's company. And then by the power of the Spirit, they began to speak, telling, telling of God's great deeds of power. And crowds gathered around, not knowing what was going on. That happened to us, too. 12 or so weeks ago, we, we didn't know what was going on, how bad the coronavirus was getting. And all of a sudden, word came down from on high that we should not gather in large groups. First, it was restricted to 50, then to 10. Then we weren't supposed to gather at all. In the same way that the Holy Spirit blew those first gathered disciples out of that comfortable upper room, we were blown out of our comfortable, secure, familiar worshiping spaces, our congregational homes, our church buildings. But just as quickly as things changed in the Acts of the Apostles, so they changed among us. You, following the leads of your pastors and deacons and PMAs and ministers, you, all working together, began to find new ways to proclaim the gospel. No longer able to gather in a single space, sermons and worship services, devotions and Bible studies went out over the internet, were live-streamed and broadcast on TV and radio. People without internet received additional mailings to stay in touch, or people visited them on their front lawns, or spoke to them through windows, or contacted them by telephone, and new means of contact came into being, making sure that isolated people weren't too isolated. And we, a people who are forever moving at the speed of church, which is a hard speed to mark, suddenly, in a week's time or two weeks' time, transformed how we were about the work of church. And in the same way that crowds were drawn to the people in Jerusalem at the sound of the Holy Spirit, in the same way that strangers who were unfamiliar with the languages being spoken gathered together and heard the gospel, so too people who hadn't before been part of the language of our liturgy in our comfortable sanctuaries began to hear the gospel in new ways. People who were unchurched or dechurched caught our worship services online. People who hadn't had direct contact with anybody but the pastor for a long time received phone calls and mailings. Young people and old people, people with the internet and without internet, all of them all of them, especially those who had not been connected in meaningful ways before, began to say, what is this? How is it that we're hearing now, as we never have before, contact, connection, preaching and proclamation, good news from Christ's church? Now, when that happened in Jerusalem, there were among those crowds that gathered, the Elamites and the Parthians and the Medes and all those strange foreign names, there were those who apparently had some kind of Lutheran formation in their background because seeing all this happen, they asked, what does this mean? Now, they were the well-prepared followers, asking questions, opening up possibilities, wondering where their future was going. There were also some in that crowd who were way too quick to blunt that question with answers. Oh, they sneered. These people are just full of new wine. But Peter... Peter stood up and said, oh, no, no, no. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. Even we don't have booze for breakfast. No, no, this isn't about bottled spirits. This is about the Holy Spirit moving among God's people as God has promised since the days of the prophet Joel. God's Spirit pouring out that the whole world may know of God's power and of God's care and of God's love for all. I can assure you, that in the days and weeks ahead, as you begin to discuss among yourselves when and how you will begin to gather again in person for worship, if you're not among the small number of congregations already doing that, there will be those who, 
especially having encountered your church for the first time online or in other ways, will ask, what does this mean that you're considering going back to gathering in person? And there will be those among you who will be quick with answers, quick to blunt the power of questions, who will say, oh, that was just something we had to do. It was a novelty. It's going away. We're done with online, with telephone trees, with all the other things we had to do because we couldn't be in the building. Don't. Don't let those easy, quick answers blunt your future and what the Spirit is calling and inviting you to do. Be those, inside as well as outside the church, who ask of this moment in time, what does this mean? And continue to engage that question. If your reach has been expanded because of the new things you're doing, why stop them? Why not continue to pursue them to see what they will mean? Some don't need to continue. Some ought to. Ask those questions. Engage. Engage those questions and, and follow the Spirit into the world to continue making known to others the powerful deeds of God, the love and the presence and the encouragement of God. Pentecost is a, a strange and unpredictable time. And both stories from Pentecost, the story of the Acts of the Apostles with the wind blowing disciples out of the room, and and the gentle, quiet story of Jesus stepping through a locked door and breathing on his disciples, both ended up in different places. When, when those chapters ended, nobody knew where they would go. We, too, don't know where we're going or what's going to happen next. In the case of the disciples in Jerusalem, the, the spirit blowing, Peter preaching, 3,000 new Christians were baptized that day. What a splendid outcome. In John's Gospel, well, a week later, the disciples are still stuck behind locked doors. They haven't budged an inch. What a disappointing future. We don't know which direction or both or neither will go. We only know this moment and the movement of the Spirit inviting us out into the world in new and strange ways because of the coronavirus and all that's come with it. As you step from this Pentecost moment, into your future and your congregation's future. I want to leave you not only with the inspiring vision of the wind blowing among the, God, the disciples in Acts, but of that gentle promise of Jesus who stepped through the door into that locked room with a dozen other people, who breathed on the disciples in his own gift of the Holy Spirit, who before that said twice, peace, my peace, I give to you. That would be my prayer for you, that you know God's peace, that grounded, confident, calming presence of the Holy Spirit that lets us endure all, because we know, we know we're not alone. I will not leave you with the false peace of assuring you that, oh, it'll all be fine because I can't give you that assurance. No one can. I won't leave you with the fake piece of saying, yeah, it's been a rough spring, but it's okay. I won't deny the loss, the grief, the anger, the disappointment of, of funerals that couldn't happen, of weddings that had to be rescheduled, of proms and graduations that simply are never going to be. But I do leave you with this piece, the sure and certain peace of the promise that we are not alone. All of us, the Nebraska Synod Christ's whole church, are in this together, here for one another, here with one another, to encourage and uphold, uplift and pray for one another, to work together to ensure that our proclamation continues. And the peace of the promise that we are not alone because God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, who can transform darkness into light and even death into life, is with us always. In that promise, in that confidence, is the gift of peace. And that gift, friends, is my prayer for you in this Pentecost season and always. Thank you for being the faithful people you are. And thanks be to God for the gift of peace, and for the spirit that draws us into his world. Amen.